Most people are not aware of the fact, but we live in a massive, inexhaustible energy field. It's supposed to be a joke, although it's not funny for us humans who are in the same condition, but two small fish are swimming along when a bigger fish passes them and remarks, The water's lovely today, isn't it? And then one of the small fish asks the other, What's water? That's supposed to be funny because the fish asking the question is completely immersed in water and couldn't survive without it. The humour disappears immediately when you realise that most people are in the same position and they would ask, what is the universal energy field, even though they are immersed in it and couldn't survive without it? Because of this severe lack of knowledge, we miss out every day of our lives that we do not accept what's been offered to us as a free gift. For example, we can grow fruit and vegetables, but without major effort we could easily have much greater results with six crops per year and each crop being four times larger. How? With a large greenhouse like this. This is a triangular greenhouse. It has a second floor at this level and the effect of the greenhouse is felt outside it as well. This structure was built in Canada by Les Brown and it produced food for him continuously in spite of the bitter Canadian winters. The structure is a pyramid. Cucumbers grown outside a pyramid average one pound in weight, while those grown outside the pyramid average four pounds each. Tomato plants average 14 10 to 14 pounds per plant outside, while grown inside they average 50 to 60 pounds per plant. Cabbages grown outside weigh 3 pounds, while inside they're 12 to 13 pounds each. Inside, radishes grow to 4 inch diameter. Lettuces are 2 to 3 times larger. Beans grow to 25 inches long and 1 and a quarter inches wide. Growing times are the same, but the pyramid draws water up out of the ground as needed. It gets rid of pests and prevents decay of any type. A pyramid can be built from any rigid material, but it needs to be aligned north-south and have sides which slope inwards at 51 degrees, 51 minutes, 14 seconds. The dimensions which Les Brown used were 46 feet ten and a half inches along each of the four base edges and 44 feet four and a half inches from a base corner to the peak. It's essential to have every corner and every apex joined together solidly. A pyramid causes the universal energy field to flow up the edges of the pyramid and through the structure generally and the effect spills out to plants around the base as well. It has enormously beneficial effects on plants, animals and humans. That's one way to access the, hum the universal energy field. Another way is to use a coil of wire. Batteries are charged by applying a high enough voltage to them, but the rate of charge for a battery is not constant. In the first split second, the very light electrons from the charging source spiral down the outside of the connecting wire at the speed of light. When they reach the battery being charged there's a problem and that is the fact that the charging current inside the battery is carried by much heavier ions and they don't move at the speed of light. A tiny fraction of a section, second after switching on the electrons reach the bottleneck of the heavy battery ions and so they pile up in great clusters. This has the effect as if a much higher voltage source had been connected to the battery and that causes a much greater rate of charging. This effect only lasts for a fraction of a second and if you're using a, an ordinary DC charging source it only occurs once during this charging session. However, if we choose we can arrange our charging circuit to do this switch on style of charging thousands or hundreds of thousands of times each second. There's a, a room temperature superconductor of the universal energy field and we call it a permanent magnet. Every permanent magnet 
directs a continuous stream of energy through it, although not as shown in schools where the field is distorted by hundreds of tiny iron filings which themselves act as tiny magnets during the school demonstration. The people who have been opposing the introduction of free energy for more than a hundred years now tell us magnets have power but they can't perform work. That statement is as silly as a statement can be. Magnets do not have power. Instead, they channel the universal energy through them, and they most certainly can do useful work. Take the permanent magnet motor of Charles Flynn as an example. The very impressive permanent magnet motor of Charles Flynn is shown in patent US 5455474 of October 1995. The patent states that the motor produces a substantial amount of output energy and torque. Because it has a battery, you might mistake it for a motor which is powered by electricity, but it is most definitely not. It is a motor whose power comes from permanent magnets, and there is electromagnetic screening driven by a 9-volt dry battery. With that dry battery, the motor reaches 20,000 revs per minute. The basic design is based on this arrangement here. You have a, a permanent magnet here shown in blue and yellow to distinguish between the two poles of the magnets. It's a circular magnet like used in loudspeakers. And above that magnet, attached to a shaft which is held in place by bearings, you have a rotor which is made of a non-magnetic material and which has got a couple of magnets actually inserted and attached to it. The rotation of the output shaft, which turns the rotor, or should I say perhaps the rotor turns the output shaft, uh, it passes through to have a slotted timing disc attached to it securely here. And the slotted disc allows light to come from LEDs through the slot to phototransistors or light-dependent resistors. Now that's the basic design of the actual thing itself. Um, as it's drawn, there's not the slightest inclination for the rotor to rotate, as the rotor magnet pulls straight down. The challenge is therefore to produce a powerful, powerful rotational movement from the arrangement. These are the working parts. You've got the basic circular, or toroidal if you prefer, um, magnet, which has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven coils mounted on top of it. And above it there is the non-magnetic non rotor with two permanent magnets uh, attached to it. They've got the south pole facing upwards in this diagram and the North Pole facing downwards. And the stator magnet, which doesn't move around at all, has got the South Pole facing upwards. That's the reason for the colouring of the system itself, the colouring of the diagram. Now, looking at it in more detail, you have the set of seven coils and two rotor magnets. If one rotor magnet is directly over a coil, then the other magnet on the other side of the rotor will be half bay between two other coils. It's a clever arrangement, but with no coil powered up, the situation is like this. The south pole of the rotor magnet is attracted to the north pole of the stator magnet, but it's, par it's attracted straight down and equally to each side, so there's no inclination at all for the rotor to go round. What you can do, though, is make the magnet on the other side of the rotor do something. And for that, you power up one of these co magnet coils, electromagnet coils. That produces a small magnetic field. Now the point of this is merely to cancel out the effect of the stator magnet which attracts the rotor magnet. So this bit of the 
stator magnet is blanked out, this bit isn't. So the south pole here is pulled in this direction and it's pulled straight down, but it's not pulled backwards. And that gives an overall push of the rotor in one direction. In this particular illustration, the push is to the right. We don't want the magnet to stop, but if we do nothing more than that, it will. It will stop once it gets slightly past this coil number 34, because there's nothing going on pushing it further. We don't want it to stop, so we switch on coil 34 at just the right moment and switch off coil 32. And we do that just at the right moment, uh, which is controlled by the timing disk, which is attached to the rotor. The LEDs are on the underside of the stator, phototransistors are on the bottom of the stator, and the slotted disk is attached to the rotating drive shaft. This is an effective mechanism and it's rather attractive in that it will self-start because you never have the situation where both of the rotor magnets are exactly over a coil. That just can't happen because of the way that it's organized. With seven coils and two rotor or magnets, you cannot match them up exactly. Now the only moving part in this motor is the optical disc and the output shaft. The next step to develop this motor is to put on a second stator magnet. So you attach it the other way up so that uh, the reverse pole of the upper magnet uh, attracts the reverse pole of the rotor magnet. Now that gives you a much more balanced thrust and a larger thrust. There's more details on that in this at this link, but let's move on to the permanent magnet motor of Rob Robert Adams. When Robert was 70 years old, uh, he designed a very effective motor generator. He was told to destroy his device or he'd be killed. He decided that at his age he'd very little to lose, and so he published his design. His motor overcomes the Lenz law drag effect and through e clever engineering achieves a power output which is typically eight times greater than the input power. Although it doesn't look as if it is, his design is actually a permanent magnet motor. It operates fairly similarly to that of the Charles Flynn motor. The diagram of his motor which is supposed to show how it works is this one here. And it shows the rotor having four magnets. The magnets point with their north poles facing towards the edge of the rotor. And then there are two smaller drive magnets as they're called. Now the interesting part about the drive magnets is that they don't drive the rotor. What happens is the north pole of a rotor magnet is attracted to the uh, metal core of the so-called drive mag electromagnet. The electromagnets are powered up together in pairs with not very many turns probably on the motor, on the um, drive electromagnet. Uh, it gives just enough uh, reverse thrust magnetic field to um, cancel out the pull of the uh, stator electromagnet cores and that in turn is enough to let the magnets of the rotor slide by and when they're far enough away the output uh, to the um, or the, the current to the electromagnet in the drive electromagnets is cut off and the cutoff produces a back EMF voltage like in charging a battery and that then operates by pushing the rotor on its way. 
Now, after much experimentation, Robert found that the most efficient arrangement is where the drive, or where the cores of the drive coil electromagnets have half the cross-sectional area of the cross-sectional area of the rotor magnets. So, if the rotor magnets happen to be a circular cross-section, then their diameter will be twice that of the diameter of the drive electromagnets. Robert also found that the best gap between the rotor magnets and the drive electromagnets is uh, about half an inch, which is 12 millimeters. A further tweak to the drive system is the fact that the drive electromagnets are fed a continuous stream of electric pulses. When a coil is powered up and the current switched off, the coil generates a reverse pulse voltage pulse, sometimes called a back EMF, and that's used to push the rotor further on its way. But the really cunning part of this entire arrangement is the addition of four pickup collector coils. Now, they have the same solid iron core, but you'll notice that Robert draws them as having a much bigger core. You notice that the two so-called drive electromagnets, which are supported separately, um, are quite narrow compared to this. These appear to be about twice the, the width. Now, this is an important factor, and the really cunning part of this motor is the way that the output coils are operated. You think immediately that an output coil would be connected permanently to the output of the generator. But that is not the case. The four output coils are mounted on uh, a ring or a disc, which allows their angular position to be altered uh, relative to the drive windings. Now, what happens is, you notice that the permanent magnets on the rotor are long and narrow. So the south pole of each magnet is well separated from the north pole. All the north poles face outwards. The north pole of a permanent magnet appears to be slightly more powerful than a south pole, though the drive is not, the, the effect is not really major. But the important thing is that you only switch the on the output coils for a very brief period of rotation. Now, the important part about this is that the effect that's normally considered drag is cut off com completely by the current that you feed to the so-called drive coils. The drive coils themselves are only briefly used in each revolution. Now, this particular de design has been replicated by a member of one of the forums, and he found that if he switched on the output current going to the load at 42 degrees and switched it off at 44.7 degrees, that tiny 2.7 degree part of the rotor turn gave him an input of 27.6 watts and an output of 33.78 kilowatts. Now that's a coefficient of performance of 1,223, or if you prefer, it's an efficiency of 122,300%. Now that's spectacular. It suggests that a good length for the generator coils is shown when your, your particular rotor magnets just start to lift off one end of a 32 millimeter long paper clip. So you approach the paper clip by lowering the magnet, and when it starts to lift off, that is the optimum width for, or maybe I should say length in this case, the optimum length of the um, drive magnet or pickup magnet either way because you want the width of the coil to be one and a half times the coil length 
for the maximum efficiency of the coil. The there is another way of raising the efficiency of the motor and that is to feed uh, instead of continuous DC to the setup is to use a pulsed drive going to the, the motors um, not the motors, the electromagnets, the drive electromagnets now you want to pay attention to the direction of turns uh, that are applied to the two drive electromagnets but if you do it this way the switching which provides the current to the electromagnets that are allowing the rotor magnets to slide past instead of being dragged backwards it acts in two directions so if you connect a diode and a capacitor like this the back EMF in the coils the two drive coils gets rectified and smoothed and fed back to the drive battery the overall arrangement of the entire setup is like this you have the DC input going through an interrupter through the two um, drive electromagnets and back out to its rectification and battery feed. The AC output which comes from the uh, output coils is connected in a series daisy chain link here to raise the uh, voltage level of the AC output it's very effective but now Robert has found the following things he says use only pure iron for the cores of the drive and generator coils wind a generator coil with a resistance in the range of 10 to 20 ohms for a small model use a voltage between 12 and 36 volts for a small model for a small machine make the contactor star disk only one inch in maximum diameter. Keep all the wiring short and of low resistance. For a small machine use a fuse of 500 milliamps to 1 amp. Install a switch for both convenience and safety. Use small bearings. Don't use seal bearings due to their grease drag. Now a word of extra on that and that is p people have found that if you use um, an electric drill attached to the center part of a seal bearing be it a roller bearing or a ball bearing doesn't matter if you spin it fast enough and long enough then the grease gets melted off to such a degree that the f uh, rotation of the bearing is very smooth and you could if you want use seal bearings but Robert goes on to say use only silver contacts for the pulse switching. If you're using powerful magnets then vibration becomes a problem. The air gap is not critical but reducing the air gap increases both torque and input power in proportion. For higher voltage and lower current connect the generator coils in series. If the drive windings are low resistance and the input voltage is high then it's advisable to use a transistor for the switching to eliminate sparking. Tuning the points is vitally important unless you use transistor switching. Using ferrite magnets you should, you should use ferrite magnets for all input voltages below 120 volts. If you're constructing a large model involving large superpower magnets then greater power is needed to drive the machine the greater the torque, the greater the vibration, the greater the copper content and so on. Please remember that any wiring that you use needs to be able to carry the current without overheating. In the ebook, there is a table at the start of the appendix which gives you the rating for all the different sizes of wire. To summarize then, a properly built Adams motor is a small desktop device which pulls in from the universal energy field a great deal of excess energy which can power a household providing heating, cooling, smoke-free cooking, lighting, 
clean water, and power for computers, mobile phones, e-readers, MP3 players and the like. Um, this is a very interesting and very effective design.